uh, Barry Beck, the uh, one-time face of the New York Rangers, or among the faces of the Rangers, in the early 80s, came out with a blistering uh, Facebook post uh, yelling at the New York Rangers, the NHL as a body, and uh, Team USA Hockey, believing that uh, Mark's uh, mental health deteriorated, much like many football players have as a result of hits to the head and CTE. Um, joining us now on the phone is a former New York Ranger and a guy who was voted as one of the top 100 Rangers of all time. And it's uh, my pal Tommy Laidlaw. Tom, Carton, and Roberts on the fan in New York City. How you been, pal? I'm doing great, guys. How are you doing? Great. And thanks so much for taking a few minutes to join us here. You, yeah. were, you were a teammate of Mark's, I think, for uh, his entire Ranger career, pretty close to it. Uh, give people an idea of the Mark Pavlich you knew as a younger guy. We'll start there. Well, first of all, great guy. He just, um, you know, it's funny. He was that Minnesota kid who really didn't care about New York City. He didn't care about getting all dressed up. In fact, we were telling stories this morning how uh, he would always wear a pair of corduroy pants and a flannel shirt uh, to practice all the time. And we had a dress code that you had to have a tie and jacket on when he went to games. So he would wear the same flannel shirt and corduroy pants and just put a jacket on and a tie. So it was like <laughs> five different colors all mixed up. And he just, everybody kind of laughed about it, giggled, and that was just Pav. And he could care less. He didn't get wrapped up in the whole New York City thing. Uh, he was a fun guy, great teammate, incredibly hard worker. He's one of those guys that's always the first on the ice to work on his game. He just he wanted to be good at what he did. He didn't care who else saw what he was doing. He just knew what he had to do to be good and, and wanted to do it. And Puff, too, he's a small guy. We'd go into places like Philadelphia where you know the intimidation factor was huge and didn't, didn't bother. In fact, it didn't bother him, but he really gave it back to him as well. So, you know, great memories of him as, like I said, a great teammate and, and just a good person too. So when you hear all the stuff that's happened to him in the past, in a little while here, it's it's a pretty sad story. Sure. Like, listen, we all recognize there's, you know, you guys have to kind of have two personalities. There's who you are as a professional hockey player. And then there's who you are off the ice, family guy, kids, your know, friends, that kind of stuff. So we all respect that there are, that you guys live two lives, essentially. All athletes do. Was he consistent? Throughout his career as who he was off the ice as just a regular kind of hard-nosed blue-collar guy that wasn't all that interested in the trappings of the New York nightlife and fame and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. He never changed. You know, he had one uh, one game where he scored five goals. And, we were again, we were joking around about this morning talking about him. And when he scored the five goals, like, he scored, like when he scored a goal, he would just line up at center ice or go back to the bench like it was just another day at the office. He really didn't know. It was, everybody else was going crazy and throwing hats. It was this big event, scored five goals in one game. But the mark, he was like, okay, well, that's, I'm, I'm supposed to do that. You know, that's, that's my job. I'm supposed to score a goal. So, no, he was great. He was always the same. Yep. Did he talk, because he's, you know, legendary, and everybody on that Olympic team is, because that's one of the most epic moments in sports history. Did he talk a lot about that experience in the locker room? Was that something he would share stories about? No, Mark would talk about fishing, uh, Bob Dylan playing his guitar, uh, laughing and joking around, but he, he wasn't, it's funny, like he was so, he worked so hard at his game to be great, but I never got the sense that he really loved the game. Like, you know, I grew up in Canada. I, I wanted to play hockey since the time I was six years old. And I know Mark was motivated and everything, but I, it's not that he didn't love playing, but it wasn't like it was all of his life. In fact, it was just, it was a job to him. He worked hard at his craft to become a great NHL player. And that's what he was, but like he he retired from the game early. He right. just didn't want to put up with stuff anymore, so he just left the game. And uh, and we weren't surprised at all. Like a lot of guys would not have done that, but when Mark did it, it wasn't a surprise. That's the way Mark was. If he didn't like it, he was just going to move on and do something else. So let's fast forward. You know, post playing career, I read a huge uh, expose on him a couple years back, in which uh, he had a neighbor that was actually a fishing buddy of his, and uh, he was physically violent with the neighbor, his family, his sister, most notably recognized that he was becoming a different guy, it wasn't the mark that she grew up with that all you guys all rave about as a guy. When did you kind of become aware that there were stories out there that he was kind of becoming this isolated hermit in Minnesota with uh, with bouts of, of violence? Well, as far as being the isolated hermit, as you call it, we yeah. knew that that was going on with him anyway. But that we weren't surprised. We didn't think something was wrong with that. That was just Mark Pavley. Okay. Like the fact that he would live out in the woods didn't signal anything wrong at all. Once we heard about the incident with his neighbor, apparently they were fishing and they, I, I guess the story is he thought the neighbor spiked his beer or something. So he, he attacked him with a metal pole. And so when we heard that, 
you know, at first you hear the story, well, that, that's not Mark. And then you start to hear, you know, that he got, when they went into prison, they uh, determined that he was mentally unfit to stand trial. So now he's okay, there's some real issues here. And you started to hear through Barry and through posts that his sister would, would make on Facebook that there's, you know, the a whole history of other incidents leading up to that particular incident. And, you know, obviously there was some concern. And the family really believed that it was CTE, you know, coming from a lot of concussions and head injuries that he, that he had when he played, which, which may be the case, but we don't know that. So. After he leaves the NHL at a young age, like you mentioned, did he have relationships with some of his former teammates or did it just kind of immediately go away? Well, that's a great question because uh, it really never changed. But like his relationships with us was uh, was was great. He's a fantastic guy, but it wasn't like a bunch of guys like we all keep in touch with each other and get on the phone every once in a while, laugh and joke around, have a few beers, whatever. It, Marcus just wasn't like that. It was like, okay, I'm here, and but, but it wasn't like like he had to get they had reunions for the eighty Olympic team. For I understand, they didn't know whether he was going to show up or not. Sometimes, right. sometimes we show up, and sometimes he didn't. And then again, nobody really worried about it that much. That was just Mark. That's the way. It wasn't that big of a deal to him. even winning the eighty Olympic deal was yes, yeah, fantastic, and it's an honor and everything. But it wasn't like something that was going to change his life. He didn't live his life as an eighty making an eighty gold medal Olympic uh, hockey player. He lived his life as Mark Pavlich, the fisherman, the hunter. And that's the way he wanted to. That's the way he wanted to live his life. Talking to Tommy Laidlaw, one of the hundred greatest uh, Rangers of all time, and a teammate of Mark Pavlich. We're trying to figure out, you know, the story here. I know Barry Beck is livid, saying that hockey's kind of put its head in the sand. They had a settlement a couple years back with a couple hundred players about CT, and they wrote a big check, et cetera. But you know, in reading about Mark's story, you know, he lost his second wife under tragic circumstances. She fell off like a second story balcony at their home. And he dealt with heartache, for sure. So as, as you now try to come to terms with the loss, and you read what Barry wrote, um, do you think CT is possible? I know when you guys played in you know, late 70s, early 80s, there was a lot less interest in worrying about a guy getting a hit to the head or playing with a concussion, et cetera. So I'm sure all you guys did. But are you more along the lines of where Barry's going that his death is somehow attributable to a brain injury he may have suffered while playing? Or do you think he was just maybe a complicated guy who you know, became depressed after losing his wife in such a tragic circumstance and you know, never kind of recovered from it? Sure. Well, listen, CT can certainly be part of it. And, and I'm assuming we'll find out here some of the, what's, what's going on if they do an autopsy with them. Uh, I, I'm not totally with Barry. I, I have total respect for Barry. He was a captain. He's a friend of mine. You know, as, as, a, as a team player, you know, you kind of, hold those guys in high regard. You know, there's, there's always going to be a bond between all of us that, that played together. That's, sure. that's just the way we live our lives. But I don't necessarily agree with it. Barry's really taken the stance that the league and the Players Association and alumni and everything has kind of turned their back on players. And, and I just don't buy that at all. You know, Barry, Barry's a fantastic person. He, he's, and he's dealt with tragedy himself. He lost his son recently uh, up in Canada. Uh, and he's been over in China and kind of away from the hockey world here. But the hockey world does so many great things for other people and particularly for other hockey players all the time. But it's always done behind the scenes and very discreetly. The league and the Players Association puts millions of dollars into the alumni uh, and the alumni. But it, what's a tricky thing here, like in Mark's case, the alumni can't go to Mark and say, we need to get you help. There's, there's laws and everything. He's, he doesn't have to. Sure. He's not part of any association. Right now. He had to come to the alumni and asked for help which he finally did and they went above and beyond glenn healy another former new york ranger runs the alumni now and he did a fantastic job of getting him help um you know especially legal help to move the process along so he could ultimately get out of uh get out of prison so i, I just I, I don't buy the notion that we we're not taking care of as former players listen our pension is terrible uh, but that's our issue from way back when we played. We should have taken care of that when we played ourselves as players to complain about that now or those kinds of things now, you know, 30 or 40 years after we played. It's just, you know, the, the league really doesn't owe us anything. That's how most of us look at it. We played. It was a dream come true to play in the NHL. We were paid to do it. And then it's time to move on, and now the next group of players come. And I, assume, I, just, I, don't. I assume every one of you guys would say the same thing. You know, if someone had told you, look, there's – you know, there's the possibility of getting, you know, CT or shortening your lifespan. When you're 18 years old, you're going to say, I'm playing. Oh, don't totally, Yeah. Ten times over. Right. Yeah. And I'd even do it now. Like, listen, I've had many concussions, and uh, I, I'm assuming I've got CT. I think that's just, that's just an, an, that's the way it is. Uh, but would I change anything? No, I'd play longer. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't change a bit, yeah. Right. Well, you, you can't play still, right? I mean. 
Well, I'm probably in better shape now, Craig, than I was. <laughs> <laughs> you might be. He's a hockey yeah, player through and through, man. Well, yeah, most yeah. hockey players go through that. Most hockey players, when they retire, usually go through that first. They gain 20 pounds real quick. <laughs> And then they recognize, wait, I'm 38 years old. <laughs> I got to do something to stay in shape. Um, oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, so when you know, it's funny, you know, I, I, I'm drawn to the story because of the mental health aspect of it. Yep. And and I have great empathy now for people that have that go through currently, you know, things that I believe Mark most likely went through. And I, I, I bring it up because having had my own problems, you know, I've, I've developed this empathy for people. And not just judging a person by what I read in a newspaper article or what you know what a stat line has to say, and trying to figure out, yo, who was he? And yes, he did something terribly wrong, and he paid a price for it. And you know the behavior that you know took place with that neighbor is terrible. You know he changed the course of that guy's life for sure. But I don't think it's as simple as Mark Povich is a bad guy, throw him away, and let's move on. And I think we have a tendency to do that sometimes. I don't think that's proper. Or fair when you acknowledge something happened inside his brain that changed who he was. I be- I believe that till I'm dead. Oh, totally. There's no question because again, the, the person I know from back when I played with him was that kind, motivated, great, just great guy. There's just no way he would do that to somebody. If right. There wasn't something wrong with him. There's no question. Listen, I think I think a big part of it is uh, you know guys like yourself or myself or you see a lot of people in the military. More men in particular, not just limited to men, but speaking out more and saying, listen, I have some things that I have to deal with. Like, I think it's great that you reach out and you say, listen, I have things that I have to deal with. I've made mistakes in the past and I have to deal with. I think it's important then so that the other people that maybe don't have that voice can say, well, if he's speaking out about it, then it's all right for me to seek help as well. You know, I think that's a big part of the market, and it's a pride issue, too. There's, there's a lot of guys that are in all you know, businesses and sports and everything that are hurting out there, but they feel like, well, if I reach out to somebody, it makes it look like I'm weaker for somehow. Right. Instead, of saying, instead of it more being accepted for a person to say, listen, I, there's something wrong with me. I need help. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, and people need to know that there's nothing wrong with doing yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's like something you said earlier. What are you supposed to do if the guy doesn't want the help, right? right. I mean, we right. could try to make it comfortable to ask for help, but if the guy doesn't want it, how far can you go? I don't know the answer. I'm I'm asking it because, you know, I'm sure there's people listening who have somebody in their life who they say, this person needs help. It's obvious yep. to me. But if it's not obvious to that person, they're not willing to accept the help. What are you supposed to do? Well, it's a great question because as a player, it's a, I can use his name because it's a well-publicized story. It's Joe Murphy, who was a great player. It was like Fred, I think it was first overall pick in the draft. And he's living up, up in Canada now. And uh, they, they reached out to him. He's living on the streets. Uh, uh, the family thinks it was because of CT, the same thing. And he's living out the streets, just wandering the streets all over, just like some homeless person would. And they reached out and they got him help and they got him into a clinic and everything. But then he left. He just didn't want the help. Right. He, was, he rather he wanted to live out on the streets. You're right. You can't. There's other stories about guys. Uh, I won't use these names because they're more private. I sure. one other player that was they found living out the streets in Los Angeles. Um, and, and and this guy was uh, like a, had been a good player, had been a general manager in the league. He just decided he just didn't want to uh, live the normal life anymore. Want to live <laughs> in the streets? They reached out to him, said, "Listen, we'll help you." He said, "No, I want to stay here." Wow! And so huh. he stayed there. Well, I, just real quick, I'm not you know the biggest hockey guy, so I'm talking out of my ass here a little bit. But when you're in LA, were you there when Gretzky showed up, or did you go there when Gretzky was already there? I was there already when he got traded there. Yep. So when you're just minding your business, and this is not you know today's world of social media and people find out stuff immediately, how did you find out that Gretzky had been traded to the Kings where you were playing? Well, that was a great day. So it was during the summer. I was back here in New York. I think it was like August 9th or something like that. And uh, ESPN was a big thing back then. So ESPN kept running the story. The rumors were started early in the morning that there was a rumor Wayne Gretzky was getting traded. And back then when that was going, you go, no way. There's just no way it's happening. And then as the day went on, well, there's more details coming out about the trade. Then all of a sudden you think, well, this could actually happen. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I love playing in New York. And so I went to L.A. It was great there. It was fantastic. But it was kind of like nobody really cared about us out there. And all of a sudden now you're thinking, I'm going to be playing with Wayne Gretzky. Like you know, you really, I remember thinking I felt like a better hockey player all of a sudden because he was coming along. So it sure, was, uh, it was quite it was exciting day. Yeah. And who keeps the puck on the assist that you had in which he tied the the uh, the scoring record? Does he keep that puck or do you get that puck? 
Yeah, it sure wasn't me. I think the Hockey Hall of Fame had it. Actually. That was too. You know, it was funny because I tell that story where um, there was a, leading up to this, Gordy Howe's traveling around with us because Wayne's trying to beat Gordy's record. Right. And Wayne didn't score for a couple of games, so the, 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 it's building and building. You know, now we finally go into Edmonton where Wayne had played bulk of his career, and we have a four-on-four. Four, it's like a Hockey Hall of Fame out there, except for me. So I, like Wayne Gretzky's out there, Mark Messier, Paul Coffey, Harry Curry, all these guys. So it's a four-on-four. Four, we're in their zone, and we've got three good offensive players on, and I'm the defense guy to kind of, you know, they screw up on their form. So it, nobody's paying attention to me on Edmonton. And Wayne gets stuck along the boards, and I'm standing in the slot all by myself. And, of course, Wayne finds me and gets me the puck. Now I'm in panic mode because I'm thinking, I, I don't know how to score goals. I scored 25 <laughs> goals in 10 years. So I, Bernie Nichols was getting covered by this guy off the side, so I passed the Bernie, and somehow he tips it in and scores. And we're dying laughing after the Bernie comes. Everybody else is cheering about Wayne scoring a goal, and Bernie comes to me like, Layla, what were you thinking about passing the puck to me? I was covered. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was good. Hey, hey, Craig, I got a question for you. Yeah, go. So, I, this, this always bothered me. So what grown man calls himself Boomer? Very good question. <laughs> Very good question. The story that he has always gone with is that uh, he was named Boomer when he was still in the womb, and oh. that he, uh, his mom, who obviously passed away when he was very young, could yeah. fe- could feel him kicking like a a little Boomer. So they nicknamed <laughs> him before he came out, and then wow. he, was, he was actually named after his dad. So he's right. uh, Norman Julius Esiason, but they gave him the name before he was born. But I'm with you. What <laughs> yeah. kind of guy's got the nickname Boomer? Uh. Yeah, this big Norwegian guy with a big head, too. And he's picking on you in the morning all the time, too. I hear him. Yeah. He, on you. Well, listen, uh, I'm like, uh, you know, the old furniture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Hey, you we're going to, you know, you and I have played hockey together. So if we get that yeah. uh, that game going again, uh, hopefully in a couple months, I expect yeah. to see you out there and I look forward to it. Uh, I, I would miss it for the world. Evan, good luck working with Craig. Thank you. Tough job for you. <laughs> I appreciate Say, it. There you go. Thanks, man. I think you Tommy. Appreciate it, buddy. All right, guys. Talk to uh, you, Tom Laidlaw, former New York Ranger, just sharing some thoughts on Mark Pavlich. 